Hoop Heads Podcast is brought to you by Head Start Basketball. Hello, Hoop Heads. This is Alan Stein Jr. My new book, Raise Your Game, High Performance Secrets from the Best of the Best, will be available from all major book retailers on January 8th. Raise Your Game takes a rare peek behind the curtain and shows you what the top coaches and players in the game do during the unseen hours. I share their routines, rituals, and habits, as well as proven strategies that you can implement with your team immediately. If you want to maximize your coaching impact and influence, order your copy today at RaiseYourGameBook.com. And in the spirit of the holidays, if you're interested in purchasing multiple copies for your coaching staff, team, or program, I am offering several bonuses, like a 40% discount, signed copies, and a private video call with your team but you'll have to place your order before Christmas. Once again, go to RaiseYourGameBook.com for everything you need. You never know when somebody's watching what you're doing, okay? You can't turn it on, you can't turn it off. Like Just like you said, you have to be the same no matter what you're doing. You know, wh- whatever whatever level you're working at, you know, don't worry about climbing a ladder. Do the best job you can. Where you Don't worry about the next job. Do the, do the best job for where you're at right now. And I think that that is really, really an important point. And, you know, it just, just reminds me of something. You know, I, I, I worked Five Star for many years with, with Howard Garfinkel at, at, at Five Star. And, and, and I can remember to, the, to this day, I'm working the station. I was a young coach. And he came over. And I was out there on the Robert Morris on the blacktop. 120 degrees and I'm out there and I'm sweating and I'm working as hard as I can and just the fact he'd come by my station and stop he'd be smoking his cigarette like he always did and he'd stand by the station and just look at look at what I'm doing and then I would just go you know take a quick glance over him and he would give me the head nod like just give me the yes the head nod and man I'll tell you what that just motivated me made me even work all the hard thought oh man I got his approval on that you know so that that's the kind of stuff you know that's people take notice just to people that are doing the job the right way and doing a good job Coach Joe Stasizian has 30-plus years of skill development and coaching experience. He joined USA Basketball as a player development speaker and clinician at USA Basketball National Academies and regional clinics across the United States. He recently retired from his position as athletic director for West Perry High School. Joe was also formerly the national director of basketball and youth fitness at 24-Hour Fitness, where he managed programs in over 450 facilities nationwide. This position gave him the opportunity to work with countless elite NBA and WNBA coaches and players. He's also a 20-plus year veteran coach at the Duke University basketball camp, where he has gotten to know and befriend the Duke coaching staff, including assistant coach Chris Carowell and head coach Mike Krzyzewski. Joe began his career in sports as an assistant coach at Dickinson College and later was the head boys varsity coach at Carlisle High School in Pennsylvania for 10 years. Joe is currently the director of Unleashed Potential, a basketball skill development company based in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. He has spoken at the Boston Celtics Coaches Clinic in Boston to over 100 of their youth basketball junior Celtic coaches from all over New England at the new practice facility in Boston, and will also be running a clinic for the junior Celtics on December 28th and 29th in Boston. Joe was presented to a group of FIBA national team coaches from eight different countries at the University of Delaware this past October on effective youth basketball development and recently held a clinic in Ontario for the premier youth basketball organization for over 100 kids. If you're finding value in the Hoop Heads podcast, please give us a rating and review wherever you listen so more of the basketball community can find the show. Have your pen and paper at the ready as you listen to this episode with Coach Joe's decision from Unleashed Potential in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. Hello and welcome to the Hoop Heads Podcast. It's Mike Cleansing here with my co-host Jason Sunkel. And tonight we want to m- welcome in to the podcast Coach Joe Stasizian. Joe, welcome to the podcast. Hey, thanks, Mike. It's a pleasure for me to be here. I really appreciate you and Jason having me on tonight. Yeah, we're excited to get into, uh, dig into your past and learn a little bit about what you're doing today. Uh, you've done a lot of great things in the game of basketball, and we're excited to get a chance to pick your brain and kind of talk a little bit about your basketball journey. So let's go back in time, Joe, to when you were a kid and talk a little bit about how you got into the game of basketball from an early age. Yeah, Mike. Well, you know, growing up in uh, Carlisle, Pennsylvania, Carlisle's always been a hotbed for uh, for basketball. Uh, story program, you know, four state championships in a row with Billy Owens and Jeff, you know, Jeff Lebo, part of that, and uh, uh, Jeff's dad, Dave. And I played at Carlisle also 
for the same coach that uh, Dave Lebo played for, uh, a guy by the name of Gene Evans, who's a legendary coach in Pennsylvania, uh, who now has passed away, but he was a very close friend of, of Coach Bobby Knight's and uh, was, was of that, that kind of school, tough nose type of coach. But, uh, you know, I, I started out, you know, as a young kid, one of, one of the great former players of Carlisle used to run a, run a league for us down at the old uh, Police Athletic League in Carlisle. And that's that's where I first got started and got a love for the game. And and, and then also, uh, you know, I, I got to mention this: my dad, who was a you know a son of Polish immigrants, uh, was loved basketball. You know, his dad passed away at an early age. You know, of, of uh, you know working in the coal mines and stuff like that. And and he didn't have much, you know, growing up. And he really really you know got a love for the game of basketball. And he's the one that really really got me started off you know, um, early on in the game. So what about it, your dad, when you say that he got you into the game, what was it? Was it watching games? Was it taking you out on the driveway? Was it, what was it about your dad that made you want to get involved with the game of basketball? How'd your dad really spark that interest in you? Yeah, but yeah, you know, I, I can remember as a kid, you know, he'd take us to the old Baltimore Civic Center, you know, <laughs> watch Earl the Pearl Monroe. There West you go. Yeah. And, and those guys, and I was just completely mesmerized by that, you know, my first NBA games, and, and also taking me out in, in the yard and stuff, you know, in the, in the driveway and playing. And then, and then I can remember just sitting up, he was a big Celtic fan back with the Hondo Havlicek days and all that. So, we, you know, we'd watch games and stuff like that. And that's, that, that's really how, how it got started, you know, from an early age. Uh, and then, then I had I had a really really neat experience, and I, and I talk about this when I speak for USA Basketball and different places I speak around the country. I talk about uh, you know what really got me involved in uh, the skill development aspect as a young seventh grader here at Carlisle on the junior high team. Our, our coach Gene Evans would take us to the Little Juniata College in the in the foothills of Pennsylvania uh, to a camp, and, and and believe it or not, it was uh, run by Press Maravich and his son Pete. And, uh, you know, I got great memories of, of, of seeing Press Maravich, you know, bring Pete to camp and Pete would put Pete through all these, you know, developmental drills and all the amazing stuff. So they, they were way ahead of their time back then doing all that stuff. And that's where I really fell in love with uh, skill development. And, and I, I could still I still have a a, uh, a form that Press Maravich, he, he individually wrote down for each camper what they needed to improve and work on and then hand signed it. I still have that. I still have that form. That, that he handed out back in the day. So that, that, that really was a big, big part of my, uh, you know, besides my dad and my love for basketball at that time, a big part of my, my love for skill development and making what, players better. What'd you have to work on? Well, yeah, if I remember that, was, uh, yeah, one of the things that's sort of funny, that's funny you said it because I still think, I still remember this, he said I could be more aggressive. And, uh, and it was funny because as I went through high school at Carlisle, played on some very, very good teams and, and went on to play Division Two basketball, that's one of the things that I became known for is my, my aggressiveness. Because <laughs> there you go. You took it to heart, man. You took it to heart. I did take it to heart because I'll tell you what, yeah, yeah, I still remember my college coach saying, man, you set the best screens, you know, because I used to try to literally lay people out on screens. And, I, you know, they always put me uh, in college. Our coach uh, at Shippensburg University, Roger Goodley, would put me on the best player in the other team. We'd play, we'd play Cheney State where John Cheney was the coach at the time. And he'd always put me on. They had like three or four pros on the team, and I'd always end up having to guard one of the, one of the best players. So yeah, I guess uh, I guess press coach Maravich really uh, you know really, really struck something with me there, and I really became aggressive after that. <laughs> how lucky <laughs> when you when you look back at it now from where you are, how fortunate do you feel to be able to have had the opportunity to be exposed to press and Pete Maravich back at that time in your development? Oh, you know, you know what, Mike, you know, and I, and I like I said, I, I, when I speak different places in the country or wherever, um, I always put, put that out there because it's like, you know, I've been very blessed with, with uh, the experiences that I've had. And I've, you know, literally, as we'll talk, you know, I've worked with the best across the whole United States. That's why my, I think my situation is very unique. And it goes, like I like said, it goes way back to, you know, to Press Maravich. I mean, uh, when I think back on that now, I got sort of pinch myself thinking, man, I, I was with those guys, and it was for not just one year. We went back multiple summers, you know, and he really got to know Coach Maravich and uh, really, really liked him and, and just all that stuff. It's just amazing now when I look back. I probably didn't really, you know, understand it at the time as well as, you know, now I look back and I just think, my goodness, you know, what what, what an incredible story. What's your best Pete Maravich you know, story to, from from What's your best Pete Maravich story from the time being at camp? You have a good Pete Maravich story. 
Yeah, well, sort of a yeah, well, it's sort of a Pete Enterprise thing. So th this is this is really funny. So um, the the one year we're at camp and Press Maravich, uh, you know, Pete was there by his side or whatever. He brought in uh, Press brought in like an NBA official to talk to us, right? I can't remember the guy's name, but he brought in a, a big time NBA official just to, you know to tell us some different stories or what have you, uh, you know, about the NBA. So as he's speaking, Pete Pete was like sort of off to the back. And uh, Press was in a chair. Press was sitting there with his legs crossed and his arms folded. And, and the speaker, the speaker could sort of see him off to the side a little bit. We, you know, we were in front of the speaker. And um, so, about halfway through the, this, this speech, the speaker, the speaker looks over at Press and goes, "I can't believe it." He goes, "The camp director is is, is sound asleep while I'm talking." <laughs> so here we are, right? We're seventh. Right? I'm a seventh grader. We're looking, and he's holding the basketball. The end, and Pete's standing right beside Press. And Pete's sort of like chuckling a little bit, right? This guy, this official, takes the basketball and throws it as hard as he can right towards right at press. <laughs> try to wake him up. The ball literally zings past the top, just like hit the top of his hair. His hair, and uh, and he sort of jumped and startled him, and he, and he woke up. And I'm telling you, Mike, if that thing would have hit him in the face, it would have broke his nose. I, we yeah. we were all sitting there like didn't know whether to laugh or like. He's scared, or yeah, you know, that, that's thought, a great thing to remember. But you, you must was, have worn him out. You must have worn him out. He was so tired. <laughs> yeah, I, I know, Jason. It was, it was, it was incredible, man. I mean, that's funny. I remember that type of thing. But I, I don't know. The other thing I remember is uh, Pete Maravich's socks. Okay, he had, he had, the, he had the floppy socks that he was known for. You know, that just, I just remember just looking at his socks. And here's the other thing: um, he wore the pro kids, and I can tell you. The week, the next day, I got home from camp. I went out and, and begged my parents to buy me a pair of those pro keds. He wore the pro keds, uh, if you remember that, and he wore the gray floppy socks. So you know, the, I mean, besides the skills and all the crazy stuff, you're just mesmerized, like what the heck, what, what's going on here? And then, and then you know, just just those things. Everybody wanted, I wanted to be like Pete Maravich. I went home and I worked on all that stuff, you know, and I got the I got the pro keds and I got the floppy socks. I mean. You know, like like today, people want to be Steph Curry or whoever. You know, we I wanted to be Pete Maravich. I mean, after, after that, and a lot of kids during that time really, really, you know, looked up to him because of you know what he could do. Absolutely, I think of the you know the Pete Maravich stationary ball handling drills. You know, that's what I grew up. That's what I grew up on. I mean, I I spent probably as much time doing that as I did anything else with basketball, especially when I was at a younger age. I remember getting up before school and going out in my basement and, you know, dropping the ball behind my back and catching it and throwing it through my legs and doing all those kinds of things. And just, again, I think he had a huge impact. And it's amazing if you think about, you know, Pete Maravich as, as a star basketball player, you know, a lot of, you know, there's not as much tape out there on, on Pistol Pete as there are on a lot of guys, obviously, today with the way the, you know, media coverage is. Uh, and I think if he had been around, his playing style had been around today, uh, you know, he would have probably been far more transcendent than he even was. When you look at the numbers and the, the way that he shot the ball and the amount of scoring that he did without a three-point line, it's just, it's it's unbelievable. I know. Yeah, you know, and the thing of it is, like you said about the drills, I, I still know, even when I was at Carlisle and ran my own camp at Carlisle High School, um, you know, for young kids during the summer, we always started out. I, I mean, I, I carried those with me. Those those drills. We always started out with all that stuff uh, before you know the beginning of camp as a warm up. All those all those fundamental drills. Yeah, and I think there's still you know I think there's still a tremendous amount of value in those, especially for younger kids, just to develop that eye hand coordination and familiarity right. and com comfort with the ball. Um, you know, I still have, especially when we're doing young kids with camp. I know that. Uh, you know, there was lots of years when I'm running my camp that I run the ball handling station and we do a lot of those just to, again, get kids to have the ball in their hand. It's something that you can do sitting in front of the TV or in your basement or wherever. You don't need a lot of space to be able to do them and you can work on, work on things and get better. So again, another legacy that Pistol Pete has left behind, uh, yes. you know, beyond all the statistical, uh, you know, the amazing statistics that he, that he left with us. So, um, can you talk a little bit about, uh, <clears throat> while you were, at Carlisle, uh, what were the highlights of your high school career, and then a little bit about your recruitment uh, to college and what that process was like for you at the time you were going through it? Yeah, so Carlisle, so like you know, Carlisle is very well known for the Billy Owen. It's Billy Owen's era, you know, winning the four state championships, and he was. Some people still consider him to be the best high school basketball player ever, but um, 
Yeah, my, my high school career, actually, I was a little bit older than Billy. Actually, Billy, I knew Billy since, you know, a young kid because he was a little bit younger than us. But, you know, we would play, still play with us and stuff like that. When we did pick up games down at the playground, at the park. You know, to this day, people still don't do that as much anymore. But anyway, unfortunately. But, um, yeah, so we were, my last two years or my junior and senior year, uh, we had very, very good teams. Won the league back to back. And we really started, I mean, Carlisle's always been known to have a very, very good basketball program. But we really started, kicked off the era of all that stuff. Uh, you know, my two years, you know, a couple years before the state championship era is when that all really started to roll out. So what happened was, um, this is this is sort of interesting because I got hurt my sophomore year playing football and missed my whole sophomore year of basketball. And uh, basketball was my first love. So I gave up football. And then once I, once I graduated from Carlisle, I wanted my year back. So I went to uh, post grad, did a post grad year up at Cheshire Academy up in Connecticut, which is a, a, you know one of New England powers, uh, it's in, you know back in the day. And I think it still is. They're still very very good. So I did my post graduate year there, and this was like around 1978. And it was interesting because people always ask me my relationship with Coach K and Duke. Like you know, where did you? How did you ever meet him? Well, as it turns out, a guy by the name of Chuck Swenson who later went on to be an assistant at Michigan with Tommy Amaker. He was a young graduate assistant for Coach K at West Point at the time. And uh, uh, Chuck was at literally every single one of my games, my postgraduate games at Cheshire, recruiting me to come to West Point. So, and, and Coach K was there at that time. So what happened was, um, so I played out my year, had some Division three people looking at me, small, like some Ivy League Division ones. Um, so... West Point, Chuck Cock tackled me and said, okay, it's, it's, it's all done, Joe. We just need you to come up and get your get your physical, and uh, we'll get this done, and, you know, we'll have you you'll come play for West Point. Well, at, at that point, you know, I, I didn't know much about Coach K. Um, that's why I first met him way back then, like in 1978. Um, I just I got some cold feet at that time, just decided, you know what, I didn't know, really know if I wanted to do the military thing at that point. So I decided not to go there. And ended up going to Trinity College up in Hartford, played Division Three there for a year, decided that the felt that the school was a little bit too small for me and wanted to play at a bigger school. So I, I ended up transferring to Shippensburg University, playing Division Two, And that's where I uh, finished out my career after that. So that's how basically how the uh, all, all the recruitment uh, went. But that's when I first uh, met had met Coach K. And as it turns out, he would have left two years into that, and he I would have been there my last two years without him. But um, that's my uh, my first contact with him. Yeah, interesting. I think it's always – I've had an opportunity to go to – I have not been to West Point, but I had an opportunity to tour the Naval Academy and also tour the Air Force Academy at various times over the last couple of years. And I'm always struck whenever I go there. I'm just amazed by the young people that are there, and you see sort of the – the lifestyle and the discipline that it requires to be able to go through those two academies. And I'm sure West Point obviously is exactly the same in that respect. Uh, and I'm just amazed yes. that young people make the decision to go there and, and, you know, have that type of discipline in their life. I know that that's probably not a decision that I would have made at age 18. And I have such tremendous respect for the kids that do that when you figure they could be at, you know, whatever university X and, you know, partying and going to school and doing whatever. And then here, you know, you have the kids that are at the academies and just the things that they're required to do and the just, the, again, the type of leaders that they become as a result of being a part of that. And so I just have tremendous respect for people who, you know, kids who make that decision at a young age. Yes. Well, you know, it's, 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 sort of, it's really interesting. Coach and I, uh, we were just emailing back and forth the other day, or actually the other week, uh, Coach K and I about um, – it's just such a small world. The basketball world sometimes is a crazy small world. But anyway, um, Matt Brown, who played for coach at West Point, actually one of the best players to ever play at West Point. One of, I know for sure one of coach's best players. When they did the 30 for 30, when coach got his 1,000th point, he was down when they, when they did that thing, he was down there with coach, and he was included in all that. But Matt Brown lives right around the corner from me here. We just went out to dinner recently. A very, very good friend of mine. Um, played for coach there, and then around the other corner, I have uh, we have Gary Steele, who was the first African American football player at West Point, and he was an All American there when uh, when coach was a basketball player there. So coach and he are very very good our classmates at West Point, are very very good friends, and his uh, daughter is Sage Steele. So um, gotcha. Yeah, yep. 
Yep, with so, ESPN. Yep. Yep. So I have, I, you know, coach and coach knows that that they're in my. I told coach, I said, yeah, I have Matt around the one corner from me in my house in Carlisle, and I have Gary, his other good friend, uh, his old classmate, around the other corner uh, from me. So he said he, you know, put a big smile on his face and know that that all three of us are. Uh, are, are, are living that close together and our friends because we have we have the u.s army war college here in carlisle so all the a lot of the military colonels and generals that come through here a lot of times come back and retire here interesting so how did you develop the relationship with coach k despite the fact that you didn't end up going to west point because obviously you had you know you had a connection you you know right. you obviously talked to him through the process but then you know, I think about myself or, you know, there were coaches that recruited me that, you know, I ended up not going to their school. And then obviously, you know, I don't have relationships with all those people. So how did you manage to, you know, keep that relationship going? Or how did that relationship build beyond just the, you know, hey, you know, why don't you come play here at West Point? And then, you know, it's over. How do you how do you how do you keep that relationship alive? Yeah, good question. So um, so after that, you know, when I became a young coach at Carlisle former player and uh, you know an assistant and a young coach here head coach um, I contacted coach again because you know <clears throat> I love Duke basketball I, I, I you know I went once I, I heard about coach and all the stuff he's doing at West Point really like that you know that part about him so I contacted him just wrote him a letter and said I reached out to him and that's oh, I've been working Duke camp now 24 years I'm a 24 year veteran so going way back then I wrote him a letter and just said hey coach I really love the game of basketball I really love Duke basketball, and I shared the story about him recruiting me again, and uh, and all that. So I, I would love to come work at camp. So he he, he allowed me, wrote back, said we'd love to have you, Joe. Okay, so I work I work camp, and uh, you know the the rest is history. And I, and I can tell you, Mike and Jason, that camp um, there's probably a thousand coaches on a waiting list for that camp. There was very little turnover. Um, it's probably one, in my opinion, I, I've been worked so many camps through my career. It's, it's a very, very – one of the best camps because it's a teaching camp. It's not just roll the ball out and play. It's not like Coach K shows up the first day and then doesn't show up again. You know, doesn't show up to the last day. He's there every single day, talks to the campers twice a day, very involved. They run their camp like they run their program. It's first class. It's very tough. You wake up at 7 o'clock. You don't get back to your room till 11 o'clock at night. You don't have – you have very, very little free time. So through the years, he and I have developed a very, 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 very good and close relationship. Uh, as a matter of fact, he, uh, Don Showwater, contacted or, you know, talked to Coach. Coach recommended me to be working with USA Basketball. Um, you know, and, and our relationship just grew through the years, you know, and, and also with 24-Hour Fitness, which, uh, you know, what I did there, that'll be, you know, I'll share that stuff with you. But um, through the years, that relationship grew. And, and even like, you know, he still talks about, he said to me many, many times, you know, Joe, when you were a, a young coach at Carlisle High School teaching in a classroom, five classes a day, whatever, did you ever think you'd be, you know, have the opportunity to be doing the things that you are, that you are right now? And I, and I had to tell him, I said, Coach, no, really, I, I really never ever, dream, ever dreamed that I'd be working for USA Basketball or, you know, doing the things that I, I'm able to do now, the things that I did with uh, 24 and uh, all that kind of thing. And, and, you know, and here's what I tell young coaches, and he, and he even said this to me. He said, he said, you know, Joe, he said, you know, and he shared this at camp with, with coach at, at one of the coaching meetings saying that, you know, when I first started camp there, I didn't go there to, to climb the ladder, to network. Like, you know, a lot of coaches think, you know, it's going to be instant. You go somewhere, a big time pro program like that, and you're going to hook on with somebody and get a big time job. He said that, you know, the thing that the thing that really impressed him was I came there. I worked hard. I just did a great job. I was never late for anything. Um you know, no matter what age kid I was working with, I did the best job I could to try to make them better. And that, and that, you know, he shared that with uh, the other coaches at camp. It was really humbling for me to have him, you know, share that share that part of me, which was which was really nice of him. So, we've, you know, and I've had former players of his work for me when I'm when I was at 24, doing skill development and stuff like that. But we we've just developed a, a, a tremendous relationship, and I can't say enough about him and what he's done for me and how he's he's really one of one of the mentors that I want to talk about, you know, tonight a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. I I hear. I'm gonna pull two things out of what you said, and one is. The fact that, you know, you look back on, you know, as you said, when you were, 
you're teaching at Carlisle High School and you're you know you're doing your thing and you know you probably thought that's my thing that I'm going to be doing and I'm going to continue to do it probably for the rest of my life and yet through the relationships you built uh, it afforded you some opportunities to do some things that you probably never could have imagined when you were 22 or 23 years old so that's number one and then the second thing is that just by being willing to reach out to Coach K and write a letter to him uh, already put you put you above 99% of the population out there who might have said, oh, it'd be nice someday to work at you know Duke's basketball camp or it'd be nice someday to be able to you know work with this person or to be able to do that. And sometimes it's just a matter of being willing to take action. And then after you take the action, to your point, you worked hard, you did what you were supposed to do, you were in a place where, again, a lot of people may have been looking, as you said, to you know use that as a stepping stone or use it as a way to you know, get themselves in with somebody that could help them to do something. And instead, you just looked at it as an opportunity to go in and do your best and work as hard as you could at the situation that you were in. And I think so many people sometimes fail to realize that, that opportunity is all around you and right. that you need to work as hard as you can in the moment that you're in. And, you know, if you think about it from a player development standpoint, and I know that you know this better than anybody, you know, it doesn't matter if you're working with a third grade kid or you're working with an NBA player, you better be there 100% full on, regardless of what the level of the player is or who the player is. Um, because if you do things right with the third grader, then there's a much better chance that you're going to do things right if you ever get an opportunity to work with a high school or a college or you know an NBA player. Yeah, you're that. That's right on. You're right on point with that, Mike. You know, and that's that. That's one thing that I've always lived by, and I and I use this a lot when I speak to young coaches. Uh, you never know when somebody's watching what you're doing. Okay, you can't turn it on. You can't turn it off. Like just like you said, you have to be the same no matter what you're doing. You know, wh whatever whatever level you're working at. You know, don't worry about climbing the ladder. Do the best job you can. Where you don't worry about the next job. Do the do the best job for where you're at right now. And I think that that is really, really an important point. And, you know, it just, it just reminds me of something. You know, I, I, I worked five-star for many years with, with Howard Garfinkel at, at, at five-star. And, and, and I can remember to, the, to this day, I'm working the station. I was a young coach. And he came over. And I was out there on the Robert Morris on the blacktop. You know, <laughs> yep. and, and it was 120 degrees, you know, and I'm out there and I'm sweating and I'm working as hard as I can. And just the fact he'd come by my station and stop, he'd be smoking his cigarette like he always did. And he'd be standing by the station and just look at, look at what I'm doing. And then I would just, you know, take a quick glance over him and he would give me the head nod. Like, just give me the yes, the head nod. And man, I'll tell you what, that just motivated me, made me even work all the hard. I thought, oh man, I got his approval on that. You know, so that that's the kind of stuff, you know, that's people take notice just to people that are doing the job the right way and doing a good job. Yeah, absolutely. There's no question about that. So I got some questions about Five Star for you, just to uh, kind of, I, I, it's something that I got an opportunity uh, before my senior year to go out to uh, to go out to five star to go to Robert Morris and actually again another connection between the two of us Billy Owens was the guy that was the main yeah. guy the week I was there so I I still remember uh, you know I still remember Garfinkel getting up at uh, I don't know if it was the first night or the last night but getting up and saying here's Billy Owens the Barishnikov of basketball and, <laughs> yes, of and uh, you know and and I remember watching you know obviously getting a chance to watch Billy play there and you know see him in person and just I mean he was just a phenomenal phenomenal athlete but you know you think about five star today and you think about the treatment that the top high school players around the country get and then you think about five star and you're basically playing on converted tennis courts outside right. chain link fence to your point it's 120 degrees you're sleeping in dorms with no air conditioning uh, it's just the fact that you look back at the roster of guys who went through five star in that particular era and it's amazing and almost unbelievable when you look at the way that basketball has evolved and what those the treatment that those types of players get today compared to what five star was like and yet i still think if you go back to your point you know that was such a tremendous teaching camp because yes. of the fundamentals and the 13th station and all that stuff uh it's just to me i think that that's something again that we we miss out on today in today's basketball system that competing and being outside and playing and getting after it and it, it just again i just don't think kids play that way you know we jason and i've talked before that you know you tell a kid now that hey you know we used to go outside and play up at the courts and they look at you like they're crazy like you're crazy you know, speaking play outside, foreign language play outside what are you talking about you know they don't, they yeah. don't, even, get, they don't even get it no 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 they don't you know what that that's something that 
I, I, I think that's hurt. That's hurt basketball, you know, because kids, you know, unless it's set up or organized, they don't want to do, you know, they don't go out and take the initiative and do it themselves, you know, and, and, and just like, you know, the old five-star days, like you said, I mean, you know, that is still discipline. I, I can remember these, these are the funny things you remember though, but, the, but it, 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 it instilled discipline in kids and respect. I can remember going into the, the dining hall and you probably remember this as a player five-star, you weren't to touch the juice. You touch the juice before they said touch the juice, then everybody goes outside and they run. <laughs> exactly. I mean, it was one of, yep. Yep. Yeah, if you remember that. I mean, it's it's a crazy little thing, but you know what? That that stuff that instilled discipline in kids and, you know, taught them that, you know, hey, here, here's the way we do things. Uh, that's the standard. Um, yeah, I can still remember a kid touched the juice and then they went, I mean, uh, the, the guy that was running the cafeteria went crazy to coach and said, all right, everybody go outside. Let's go. We're going to run. Everybody at the table is going to run because one of your teammates touched the juice before he was told to touch the juice. So it's you know, <laughs> crazy little things, but, um, all that stuff makes a difference. I, you know, I really believe that. I think the game has suffered because, you know, and, and I, I don't want to, I don't want to get too much into this, but you know, you hear people say, and I know I've heard, uh, you know, Coach Frank Martin talk about this down in South Carolina, saying how people say that you know kids kids have changed, and I'm not so sure about that. I agree. I agree with him that kids haven't changed. Adult, he says, adults have changed. We you know we allow kids. Kids will do what you allow them to do, and I just think it's you know along those same lines. Yeah, that's absolutely true. I, I don't think there's any doubt about that. That we as adults, just in the way we parent, I think about again my own, you know, my own upbring, upbringing in the game of basketball, and you know I was let's say 12, 13, 14 years old, and I would ride my bike up to the courts and be playing with high school kids and college kids and adults. And, you know, my parents, I mean, they knew where they, they knew where I was, but they didn't know right. exactly where I was or what I was doing or who I was hanging out with, whatever. And now, you know, my own kids, it's sometimes tough for them to just be able to be go out on the driveway without, you know, my wife wondering, well, how come somebody's not out there with them? Uh, and so they just don't have the same opportunities that I think kids from the era that, you know, you and I are from where, you know, we could just go out and play those kinds of pickup games. It's just it's just not available because the system is so different now. Yes, I agree. I agree wholeheartedly. For sure. And so that I mean, one thing that that you know, then to go into kind of where, you know, where you are now, in terms of the basketball space. Obviously, that has opened up a market that really was non-existent again 30 years ago. Where you're talking about having a skill development coach, so you're talking about having somebody that is a speed, strength, conditioning guy. Uh, you know, I mean, I did that stuff on my own. I went and you know ran sprints out in the park, or I went and uh -huh. my, my dad was an exercise physiologist, so he had some he had some crazy plyometrics. Mike, Mike was sneaky him. athletic when he was a kid, so <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of a it's kind of a running joke that I was uh, that I was sneaky athletic. So I I was never described as athletic, but I guess sneaky athletic might be the description. So. Um, but anyway, it's just, you know, again, it's a totally different, it's a totally different world in terms of how kids are, are being brought up in the game in the way probably you or I would were. No, I, I, you're right. I, I agree with everything you're saying there. And it's funny because you said you were sneaky athletic and you know, your father, you know, probably did some training with you and stuff like that. But, you know, I, I firmly believe, and it's funny, Mike, that you brought that up because that's, that's our model, you know, and, you know, talking about where I'm, where I am at currently now. Uh, you know, our company, um, my son and, and his wife and my daughter and I uh, run, it's called Unleash Potential, and our model, and this is what I speak with when I speak at USA Basketball, or really anywhere, um, our model is one of not only basketball skill development, but performance training. Um, so, you know, what, what we do is, and what, why everybody seems to really like this model is because most high schools, most Division three programs, maybe even some Division two programs, <clears throat> don't have their own strength and performance coaches. So our model of skill development training with the performance model, uh, we, we combine them both where you're getting performance training and skill development you know, uh, training and speed, agility, quickness all in one with a ball and without a ball. And it makes your, makes your practices and your, and your trainings more efficient. And we, you know, we, we do it in a low-cost way with, with some bands and what I call tools of the trade. Um, I've been very fortunate to be around some very, very good strength coaches. One in particular that I'd like to, like to mention is Will Stevens down at Duke. He's been down at Duke with Coach K. And he's been tremendous to me through the 24 years I've been working camp. He has shared so much of the stuff 
that he does. I've seen it personally. He shared other stuff with me. Uh, there's some other people that I've gotten a lot of. Alan Stein, who's one of the one of the top in the world, as you know. Uh, I've done a lot of work with Alan Stein through the years with my position uh, as national director of basketball for 24-hour fitness covering the whole United States. Alan and I work together and, you know, incorporate a lot of his stuff. So, you know, that that's our model. And I also have my uh, CrossFit certification because I wanted to go and do it so I could be able to incorporate some of that stuff into the basketball training and my, my uh, personal training certification for the National Association of Sports Medicine. So I, I'm what you call, Coach Eastman would call, learn it all, <clears throat> where I'm trying to learn as much as I can from different aspects and put it all together. And that's our hybrid model of training that everywhere I speak, people seem to really, really enjoy this. And there's no, there are no gimmicks. Every single thing we do is transferable. These are things that have been proven to, to work on the college level, especially the Division One level, places like Duke and other places that I've gotten this, this a lot of this great stuff from. So that model has worked very, very well for us. Um, at, at with our with our own business unleashed potential uh, my son was a division one basketball player fairly Dickinson and ended up finishing division two at Shippensburg my uh, his wife my daughter-in-law was a division three all-american my daughter who's also with us uh, was a, a division three basketball player and then became a division two track athlete so you know I, and those three do a phenomenal job I, like I said I've worked with the best in the country and and, and they are right up there at the top they, they just do a phenomenal job of teaching all aspects can you talk a little bit about then what that looks like on the ground so if I'm a kid and I come up and I'm you know I'm going to come into uh, you know get training with you can you describe what the process looks like as you bring in a new client and you're working with a kid for the first time and then what a session just in general might look like do you combine the skill development right in with the athletic training at the same time are they two separate sessions how do you how do you set that up for people yeah, so when it, here's our model also, and I got this through my uh, relationship with Duke and how they do things. We don't train position, which I, I, I firmly believe you don't train position. Like maybe you get to the NBA, you know, even at the NBA level, they don't have positions anymore for the most part. So basically, we train to be a basketball player. Uh, and, and again, I firmly believe you can make someone more athletic uh, and quicker and you know more agile. So what what our what our training uh, program would look like is, you know, we work on a lot of combo drills, and it's it's interesting you ask because recently I was down at Duke uh, working with Chris Carwell. He and I were on the floor for about an hour and a half in the K Center, their practice their practice facility before practice. Um, I was sharing a lot of stuff that I that, that we do. We do a lot of of, of combo combo what I call combo drills. Where we're incorporating defensive slide or principles into, and also offensive principles in one drill. Like maybe you do, you know, you're doing some kind of defensive footwork, defensive slide into a closeout, into a shot, a, a hard cut into a shot, or multiple cuts into a shot. So we do a lot of combo work like that, uh, which which he uh, really liked and is is now going to be using with the Duke players. Um, we also do. A lot of footwork, very big on footwork. That's one of the USA basketballs, you know. And, and put this out there: I we follow the USA basketball guidelines. Obviously, I'm a USA basketball licensed coach. I speak nationally for them, and I also work regional camps and clinics with them. So I'm very, very, you know, I'm well ingrained in the USA basketball uh, terminology and, and system uh, and principles that they use. So we definitely use a lot of those. But to answer your question, we'll do, uh, you know, some speed work, like, like, like footwork through cones and then sprint into a shot from there. Or, you know, you know, like I said, some defensive slides, some, some defensive closeouts into a shot. Um, just a whole bunch of combination type drills. We'll do some band work where we do some band work with as many bands around the, around the ankles where kids are working on their first step explosiveness while the kid, their partner across from them is, are doing two ball drills. And then when they get to a hundred pounds, they'll, they'll switch and go, their partner will go. So basically we just, you know, we, we mix all aspects of skill development, whether it's passing, dribbling, shooting, footwork, speed, agility, quickness, into uh into into the workout uh in in no specific order gotcha understood yeah because i think one of the things that i think sometimes people don't always understand is you know how how you can put those two things together is it a you know is it a separate okay so you're coming for 45 minutes for speed you know for speed and agility and then you're coming back 
you know, the next day for 45 minutes of basketball skill development, but you guys are putting them both all together into, into one workout. Correct. Correct. And, and, and some of that, like, um, you know, through the years down at Duke, I, you know, I, I've gained a lot of knowledge from Will Stevens in terms of what they do with their players, uh, speed agility, quickness wise in, in their, in their basketball workouts and their non-basketball workouts. So sometimes we, we have a program where, um, there'll be some competition in the program, whether it'll be three on three cutthroat, there'll be a segment of dribbling in that program. There'll be a segment of, and this, this is one of our best programs and favorite programs. I use this, uh, all over the country and it's very, very, it's very, very, uh, popular and very, very, um, uh, how do you want to say it? Um, I guess you could say it's very popular and the results have really been proven out, to, you know, to be very good. Um, so, uh, a section of comp- uh, com- competition, three-on-three cutthroat, dribbling segment, a shooting segment, a footwork segment, a speed agility quickness segment, you know, all in about an hour, an hour and a half. Um, so they're getting a little bit of everything in that in that program. We actually run programs like that uh, very often. So that's the, that's typically, I'm guessing, a small group type situation? Yeah, that, that one would be a small group type situation. Um, but if we have an individual you can basically, you know, you you, you, have, you couldn't do the competition thing, but you could basically run it out the same way. You know, we always incorporate some speed agility quickness into our individual sessions, which uh, people really seem to like because they, they, they see their they see the results in their kids. And that's one thing we're big on. We're big on results. We say results matter. It's not just a matter. You know, you, you can make kids tired just by working them. We're not we're not out to make kids t- tired. Everything translates, no matter what we do, translates to the game in one in one aspect or another. And then that's where I feel like I'm sort of unique, Mike, because <clears throat> my experience with 24 Hour Fitness, I worked literally in every NBA, WNBA city in the country, just about every single one, uh, for five years, working with some of the best skill trainers in in, in, in the not only United States but the world. Uh, that's where I, I really got came in contact with Kevin Eastman, um, you know, Alan Stein, Kevin and I, Kevin's one of my mentors and, and he has shared so many of his great, so much of his great stuff with me. I incorporate a lot of his stuff. I'm a disciple of his and he's been a terrific uh, friend and mentor. Let's take a quick break and hear from our sponsor, Alan Stein Jr. Can you explain a little bit? I know you and I talked about it when we had our kind of pre-podcast call, but can you talk a little bit about how you originally got involved with that opportunity and explain to people uh, who were some of the, uh, you know, besides Kevin and Alan, who were some of the people that you got an opportunity to work with and just kind of how that all came to be and then what it eventually grew into? Yes. So um, the, the, way, the, way that, the way that started uh, goes back to my Duke experience, you know, going back to what Coach said about, you know, never know when somebody's watching. So um, 24 years ago, when I first started working there, I, I, I became friends with another coach there uh, that was working camp by the name of Carl Liebert. He's a very, very close friend of mine. He became a very, very close friend of mine. Um, he's now on the board of directors with uh, for the Jim, Jimmy V Fund with Coach K, Phil Knight, Dick Vitale. And uh, he's also the COO of USS, USAA Capital Corps. And he uh, was the former um, CEO of 24 Hour Fitness. So he and I developed this relationship uh, at camp. Both our kids, all of our kids went there, you know, and grew up together and all that kind of stuff. So when he became CEO of 24 Hour Fitness, he asked me to come on and, and work for him. He wanted to change the face of basketball. He's a former teammate and roommate of uh, David Robinson the Naval Academy they're on the elite 18 together back in 86 I believe it was um, so he asked me you know he, he felt that kids weren't getting enough skill work so 24-hour fitness had over 300 facilities nationwide owned by one person so we control all the facilities <clears throat> so as national director of basketball my job was to go and this was after I finished at Carlisle um, my job was to go on and go in and find the best skilled people in every city. In some of these cities, we had multiple facilities. So that's the biggest thing with skill development. You have to have facilities. So we had multiple facilities in many of the, of the NBA cities. Hello, hoop heads. This is Alan Stein Jr. My new book, Raise Your Game, High Performance Secrets from the Best of the Best, will be available from all major book retailers on January 8th. Raise Your Game takes a rare peek behind the curtain 
and shows you what the top coaches and players in the game do during the unseen hours. I share their routines, rituals, and habits, as well as proven strategies that you can implement with your team immediately. If you want to maximize your coaching impact and influence, order your copy today at RaiseYourGameBook.com. That's um, where I went and I brought on the best skill development people, had former Duke players, former NBA players. I'd literally go and do a, like an audition with them, talk to them, interview them before I, I would allow them to come in, come into the city and, you know, come into the facility and work for us and develop. And, you know, and again, I had former WNBA players, some terrific, terrific skill, you know, one in particular, you know, Danielle Viglione, who is who does a lot for Nike internationally. She was a former uh, Sacra- played uh, at WNBA for Sacramento. Was a one of the leading scorers. Might have broke Cheryl Miller's records in the state of California. Played at University of Texas. So people like that. Then I had like then Jay Williams actually. Jay Williams and I worked together for five years before he took the job at um, ESPN. And uh, you know he was he was tremendous to work with. I mean, what a, a guy that you know really really knew the game, could teach the game, um, obviously could play the game. So uh, you know he worked with us. He I worked with him very closely for five years. Scooter Barry, Rick Barry's oldest son, who played the only Barry uh, kid that didn't play in the NBA, but played over in Europe for 17 years. Worked very closely with him. So we had. We had some very, very good people, you know, working day day to day with me, and then other people across the country. Um, so that that was really, uh, you know, a tremendous experience for me because I, I, you know, again, I'm a learn it all. So I got to learn from some of the best people across the United States. I think I, you know, and that was the largest skill development. There wasn't a larger skill development country or company in the in, in the country at, at that time. We ran a. Um, the Harlem Globetrotters ran a skill development program for the Harlem Globetrotters across the United States. They wanted to start doing some skill camps with kids. So I ran that uh, nationally also for us. So I, like I said, it was just, the, the, that's the <laughs> that's the short, long story, I guess you could say, of how that all transpired. So here's a question that I have for you. As you're running that national program, and obviously you have you know, multiple, multiple locations, how do you keep the consistency of the training and yet allow for obviously different trainers have different styles and different ways that these skill development coaches, you know, handle things? How did you keep the how did you keep the product uniform and yet at the same time, obviously when you have that many different people, there had to be some idiosyncrasies for lack of a better word, within each particular maybe facility or with each particular coach? Yeah, good question, Mike. Well, we we, we had a model, and, and my, part of my job was not only setting up these programs, but then I literally would visit. I literally would travel the country. One day, one week, I'd be in L.A. for a couple of days hitting all those facilities. Uh, another day, I'd be in Miami, or I'd be in New York, or I'd be in Portland. Uh, you know, I, I'd come home for a few days right here in Carlisle <clears throat> and go from there. And then the other the other thing is, um, I, I had capabilities of being able to see real in real time what was going on in each one of those facilities on my laptop. So I could literally sit in on some sessions on a computer and watch what was going on and, and you know go meet with these with, with people. And I'll be honest, just like anything else. And, I, and it, you know when I first started with USA basketball and you know I talk about another tremendous person, uh, Coach Showwater, Don Showwater, who, who again, you know, I, I, I've been very fortunate, and I, and I like to use Coach K's term, putting the, you know, great people on your bus. Not only great people, but people who are really experts at what they do. And uh, Don Showwater is right at the top of that list. He's been tremendous to me with USA Basketball. I'm humbled to be able to work with him. You know, he was a 10 or 11 time gold medal coach now for USA Junior National Team. Absolutely. Uh, so you know, I between him, between Coach Showwater, uh, Coach K, and and Coach Eastman. And I have the trifecta of three people that I'm really close with that I I get to do a lot with. That I'm I'm, I'm very fortunate. But anyway, as the point I was getting to, uh, I told told Coach Showwater when we first met, you know, and he was you know asking about my background. I said, Coach, I've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly because I've literally, and again, that's what makes my situation so unique. I've been in every city, just about in the United States, working with kids on up through, you know, sometimes professionals or what have you from elementary kids on up, boys and girls, both. Yeah, so I here's I guess what I'm asking is if if you had like a let's say there was a fifth grade boy 
who had average skill level and he comes to a facility in Charlotte and then he goes to a facility in Los Angeles was there a set curriculum like lesson number one we're going to try to work with them through these particular things and then lesson two we're going to try to work through those particular things did it get that specific or was it just a general you know a general curriculum of look this is the kind of thing these are the types of drills we want to do this is what we're trying to accomplish we're trusting you to accomplish it in such a way that the kid's going to get the best experience right now yeah i understand what you're saying so it wasn't a cookie cutter thing you know and and, and, you know, and part of it by finding the best, you know, we, we ended up getting rid of some people that did, that turned out it wasn't where they weren't doing what we would like them to do. Not necessarily drill wise, but necessary philosophy wise or how they handle some situations. So we, we allowed since we did try to bring in the best, we allowed them to use their expertise in a sense. Yeah, we gave them general guidelines. But, you know, we, we allow them to use their expertise to, you know, teach it the way they want to do it. Because, you know, there's so many different ways to teach things, even even with our company, Unleashed Potential. You know, we very, and I think this is a big part of skill development. You know, you can't allow people to get bored. You can't allow them to get bored and get tired. You have to be very creative. you got to use your imagination and come up with different ways to teach a certain skill. I think that is very, very important. So yeah, we, we didn't we allow them to use their own set of drills per se, but there were certain things we definitely wanted them to touch on. But it wasn't a cookie cutter thing. I think that I think that waters it. You know, I, I don't I, I don't think you're going to get the best out of it if it's done that way. Um, so we did give them a lot of freedom in terms of that. But like I said, we we monitored a lot, and I can tell you, you know, I mean, we've had, I had some. Uh, you know, uh, former NBA players and stuff or what have you that it just didn't work out. You know, they thought just because they were playing the NBA that they could teach the game. And, you know, that's sometimes your best players aren't your best teachers. Yeah, I mean, that's absolutely true. I think that, you know, it's sometimes people take it for granted how easy slash difficult, depending on how you want to look at it, that, you know, teaching the game could be. Sometimes there's somebody who's a really, really good player but just can't relate to you know, relate it down and be able to break down the elements of it to be able to teach it. And then conversely, there may be somebody who didn't play at a very high level who's just very, very good at being detail oriented and being able to being able to teach something. And I think I'm sure a big part of it, uh, because I know it's a big part of what I do here is uh, so much of it is just building a relationship with the kid, the family, the parents, and being able to communicate. And if you can communicate, uh, and then I think you're building a relationship that's going to allow you to, again, push that kid and get the maximum out of them. And to your point, when you're hiring good people, you want them to be able to have the freedom to be creative and to teach things in different ways. Because, again, the way you teach something may not be exactly the same way that I teach it, but we both can be equally effective in our own way. And I'm sure that's what you were finding when you were hiring really good people you know, to do these things around the country. Yes, yes, absolutely. You know, and again, another person I can think of is Jason Perkins. Jason Perkins, who still lives out in California, he used to run all the youth stuff for um, for the Golden State Warriors, you know, and, and he was a very, very big part of, of our program, you know, for many years. He actually was, before I came on as national director, he was a national director for a while, and then he, he left that position. But he, you know... Yeah, we had some we had some people who were very 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 knowledgeable and very very good. I mean, Carl Liebert did a great job of putting together a team of uh, you know a team of people that really changed changed the game. You know, and it's sort of interesting because you know what what USA basketball is doing today is something that we were that we had started out to do, and it was going along very well until the company got sold. Um, you know, at, at that time after my five years there but um you know basically we were we were we were doing the same thing we we're trying to get the model of 30 percent games and 70 percent skills training you know and a lot of the same philosophy usa basketball has we basically had also uh you know you, some people might say you know sometimes your people say oh you know well that's you know old school or whatever you know i, I like what coach eastman you know says all the time he goes it's not old school it's not new school we all got to be one school yeah you know I, you know there's a lot of old school things that are very good there's a lot of new school things that are very good but you know we all have to be together and you know and, and teach things the same way if we're going to change like you know which i said i think usa basketball is they're just going to take more and more you know they're going to take have more and more of a presence across the united states with youth basketball they already have their, their presence is growing by the day and and jay deming and 
Don Showalter and Andrea Travelstead and all the people from USA Basketball, they're just doing a tremendous job. And I, I tell Coach Showalter that all the time. And that's why I'm so humbled and happy to be a to, to be a part of that. He's allowing me to be a part of that because I think I have you know some valuable experience nationwide uh, to be able to to share and, and help them grow the game the right way. And that's and that's the key. That's the thing. They're doing it the right way. And they have they have great people involved in, in their programs. Yeah, they're absolutely uniquely positioned to be able to have influence on the whole landscape of you know youth basketball on up through high school and then obviously with the olympic you know the the men's and women's olympic teams to be all, all the way up through the professional ranks so they're they're the one organization that i think has the ability to maybe impact and make some of the changes that you're describing and you know cut down on the number of games that kids are playing and get them more time in the gym doing skill development and i really think that if again i think it's really in the beginning stages of exposing people to what USA basketball is about and, and doing for lack of a better word, a marketing campaign to make sure that people understand and, and that they really can become that national governing body that kind of covers the entire gamut of, you know, of basketball from the, from the, you know, youth grassroots level all the way up on into the professional ranks. And I think if they can get a handle on that, it's going to take some time. Cause obviously, as you know, there's lots of different factions out there and there's lots of different businesses and lots of people have, an interest, whether business or otherwise, in kind of keeping the system the way it is. But I definitely think that USA Basketball has made tremendous inroads in the last couple of years in terms of getting the word out through people like yourself and uh, you know other great people that are working with them to be able to share the message of, look, this is what's best for the game of basketball, and ultimately what's best for the game of basketball is going to be the best for the people who are involved in it. And I think that they're, they're just they're doing a great job. Coach Showalter, obviously, we had him on the podcast, and he was tremendous. Uh, mm-hmm. We had Coach Eastman on uh, about two weeks ago, and he was equally as, equally as tremendous as Coach Showalter. And I think when you have people with that kind of influence and that kind of mind behind the organization – uh, you can't help but continue to prosper and have success and keep moving the game in the right direction. So I'm excited to see where it goes. Yeah, I, I am too. And, and they, you know, it's, it's going to be such a big undertaking. And I'm, like I said, I, I'm I'm just very happy to be a part of it. And uh, Coach Showwater, I know, has told me that you know he, he wants to con- continue having me be a, a part, a big part of it, and you know, possibly increase my role, especially with everything that's going to be coming up. So I, I'm just, like I said, I, I'm so. Uh, I'm so humbled to be able to be involved with him because he is he is one of the best. That's like I said, I you know, with, with the people that I've worked with between Coach K and Coach Eastman very closely also, I mean Coach Showwater, there's none but there's none better than him and the job he's doing. He's an absolute perfect person for that position. I'm you know, like I said, I, I, I can speak uh, that way because I've been I've been all over this country and I've like I said, I've worked with the best and he he is at the top of the list. I mean, he he does a, he's doing a phenomenal job, and all the people at USA Basketball. So I'm just uh, just thrilled, you know, to be to be a part of it. Can you talk a little bit about what some of the things are that you've been able to do? I know you mentioned them earlier, but can you go into a little bit more detail about you know some of the speaking things you've done and some of the opportunities you've had to work at some of the USA Basketball regional camps and the things that uh, you know the things that you have going on with USA Basketball? Yep, for sure. So, you know, I've spoken at, um, let me see, three coach academies in the last couple of years. They had me speak in, um, let me think about it, Boston. I've spoken in Boston. I've spoken in Memphis and Philly most recently on uh, player development for, for the Co- USA Basketball Coach Academies, which, which is a phenomenal experience. I mean, uh, again, I feel very humbled to be able to say I was you know, one of the pe- people picked to do that. Um, also, the regional clinics, which I, I thoroughly enjoy the regional clinics because it's not about rankings. It's not about what rank are you in your class. All it's about is coming to a USA Basketball Regional Clinic to become a better basketball player, uh, regardless if you're ranked or if you're not ranked. And I, I was a, able to do those in Norfolk, Charlotte, and Queens, New York at Christ the King, the story program. Uh, we were there uh, with I was there with Coach Showwater, Christ the King, in a uh, doing a regional clinic there at the end of this summer. So, so they're the things that I, that I've done with them most recently. Um, the other thing that, that I really that I really enjoyed and I, I thought that um, was very very uh, beneficial was I, I was down in uh, University of Delaware. I got asked to speak by uh, Dr. Uh, Matt Robinson 
they, they have a group of FIBA national coaches come in every year. And he asked me, it's like an apprenticeship program. It's a really cool program that he does there. He brings in he brings in 8 to 10 or 12 FIBA national coaches. And it's, it's like a four-week program they come in. And they learn all about basketball in the United States. Like this year, we had coaches from Puerto Rico, Angola, Bahrain, uh, Uganda. Uh, you know, there, there was like eight different coaches there from different parts of the world, FIBA national coaches. And he brought me in to speak on youth development. Um, and, and, and some examples, you know, or excuse me, not some examples, some uh, best practices for youth development and skill development. So I came in and spoke to the group. He had an NBA front office person from the Wizards, uh, Vice President of Basketball Operations, Tom Shepard from the Wizards, spoke to them. He had, he had NCAA ADs speak to them. And then they hooked up with Division One colleges and shadowed those programs for a couple weeks. So it ended up being a four week program. It was a tremendous experience. I mean, you talk about learn it alls. I mean, I, I was in there for better part of two hours and just, you know, presenting to them and then taking questions. And, you know, I was learning as much about them as they were learning about me and, you know, USA basketball and what we do over here for youth development and things like that. So that was a, that was one of the really great experiences that I had. I was very honored to be asked to do that. And work with these and then we ended up we ended up the final night we all met at the Sixers game we went we were on the floor uh, before the game before the fans came in and, and a good friend of mine Billy Lang assistant coach from the Sixers met with the group talked to them um, you know answered their questions some of them had one or two of them had never been to an NBA game before some of them actually had some of their national players on NBA teams so that was a that was a really cool experience yeah, absolutely. What are when so when you talk to a group like that, and you're talking to them about you know skill development from a youth perspective, what are some of the things that you try to talk to them about? What are some some nuggets that you try to impart to them during that, you know, during that time? That when you have them as a captive audience, what are you trying to share? Yeah, here's what I, here's what I do, Michael. First of all, you know, I share with them, you know, the basically the USA basketball model. You know how we do things at what levels you know what skill levels what age levels all those kinds of things like the, the you know the eight usa basketball skill categories we go over all those which i don't know how much Don, coach showwater went into those but you know like ball handling drilling passing receiving footwork and body control rebounding screening shooting team defensive concepts offensive concepts those kinds of things so we go you know we go into all that i just share some of that with them where you know what kind of skill development I do at different with their kids at different ages, and then I really you know I spend a lot of time going over what I call absolutes, coaching coaching youth at all levels, things that you absolutely absolutely need to do is teach them the why, teach them how to communicate, teach them how to compete, which is a, I think is a learned behavior, teach kids how to work hard, which I think is a learned behavior, how to train confidence, you know. Uh, you know, quality and variety of drills. You know, like we talked about earlier, you got to have multiple drills for different skills. Um, you know, all those kind of change of pace, footwork, different types of footwork that you should be working on. Uh, still in the love of the game. So I mean, I, there's a bunch of absolutes that I go over, and I and I cover all those, and you know, and then we talk about those. I gave them that that model that I like, that model that we use. You can use that for a practice, which a practice or a skill development training that I found to be very effective nationwide. Uh, went over that. I went over some of the stuff we do with USA Basketball. Like, you know, all the national teams do these do line drills to warm up for their pivoting and passing. And, uh, you know, different competing things that, that they can do. Uh, shared a lot of what, you know, some of the speed agility quickness stuff that, that we do down at Duke. Um, shared a lot of that stuff with them that they can do with their players. So, I mean, it basically... It, yeah, I, I gave them as much as I could, and it's like I said to you earlier. We could do this thing probably for five hours tonight. <laughs> I shared <laughs> literally. I'm, I shared with them as much as I could possibly share within three hours, and I, I'll tell you, they they were fabulous. I mean, you talk about learn it alls, and then afterwards we had a question and answer period, and I, I asked them questions. I learned a lot. For instance, one of the coolest things that I learned was um, in Canada they have for their youth program. Canada basketball and their youth programs have something called zone monitors. And when they told me that, when she told me that, I was like, uh, you know, Dawn Smythe from Canada Basketball, she told me, that. I was like, well, what's a zone monitor? And she said, well, we, we actually send people out to monitor youth games. If you're playing, if they see a coach playing zone, they stop the game and tell them they can't play zone. Are you serious? Yes. That, I, is, I all, that, is, that is fantastic. 
Yes, yeah, so, so so she said they just show up. They just show up at games. All right, so I hey, asked. Joe, Joe, you and I got a new business. I know, man. I'm let, telling let's, you, Mike. Let, I, I was, let's go. I was let's go into the zone, let's go into the zone monitor business because uh, holy know. cow, around here, I, I mean, we could, we we we'd have we have so much work. It, we would be millionaires. We would, we would be 100. percent would be millionaires if we went into that. Yeah. I hear you, Jason. Yeah, I, I tell you what, man. When I heard that, I was blown. So you know, what I mean? so you know, I picked up so many nice nuggets from them. Like I said, man, I want to learn as much as I can from everybody. So I got my notebook out at the end, and I'm starting to write down stuff that they're telling me. You know, so um, that that was that was tremendously cool. Um, uh, you know, another another thing that that I recently or last two years have gotten to do, gotten very close with the Boston Celtics. Uh, the Celtics had uh, unleashed potential my son and my uh, and his wife and I up last year we did a clinic with them for their junior Celtics in, in their old practice facility which I thought was amazing and then uh, this year they had us they had me come up um, in October and I spoke to a hundred of their youth junior Celtics basketball coaches on effective youth development or youth coaching techniques and these are coaches from all over New England. They have a program, Junior Celtics program, because they're the only NBA team in, in the New England area. So they had them all come into their brand new Red Arbach practice facility. And you talk about an amazing facility. It just opened up this summer. Um, they came in, and I spoke, and, and Jay Laranega, assistant coach from the Celtics, spoke to them on effective youth youth coaching and development techniques. And that, that, that was tremendous, tremendous opportunity. I, I was very... Uh, very fortunate to be able to do that and now um we're going up here december 28th and 29th for a two-day junior soda clinic in their in their new facility for, for kids so I've, I've developed a great relationship with them they um one of their front office people heard me speak um i think maybe at the usa basket i think it was at the usa basketball coaches academy a, over a year ago in boston and approached me really liked what I did and, and, and said they would like to get me involved and you know I was very humbled by that and very excited to do that so we've got I got a great relationship with them yeah I think it's really cool that you get an opportunity to talk to youth coaches because I think that that's a an area that is severely underserved because we think about like uh, you know I went to the USA basketball coaches clinic this past August in Cleveland and it was pretty much high school coaches uh, you right. know there's very few guys who are coaching or girls who are coaching third grade teams or fourth grade right. teams that are showing up to these clinics and as a result you know you go to a lot of youth practices and you just see a lot of kids standing around in a line and <laughs> without a ball and they're not doing anything or they're you know it's not organized and the coaches are standing off on the side talking and the kids are just you know firing up shots and there's not there's just not organization it's not because those coaches don't mean well uh, obviously right. they do they wouldn't be there volunteering their time if they didn't mean well but a lot of times there's just not coach education for those particular age groups and i think that's one of the things that you know if you could tap into being able to impact youth coaches across the country whether it's recreation coaches or you know even if you take the travel team coaches if we could educate those coaches better about what are the best practices for you know running a youth team properly both through the practices and how you handle games and you know like we talked about earlier don't play a zone you know i mean you could probably go through again to think back to what you said earlier you could probably come up with a list of 10 absolutes that you could just hand to people on one sheet of paper and dramatically improve right. youth basketball coaching and so i think it's just an underserved market so it's really cool that you're getting an opportunity to do that with the celtics well you know it was interesting because afterwards many coaches came up to me and were you know a lot of them don't didn't even really understand how to run a practice or how how to keep everybody engaged and I, i'm really we're really big on that you know there's no standing around we 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 maximize every second we're on the floor having multiple players engaged like i said with our model whether it's we have kids, you know, some kids doing speed agility quickness, some kids doing basketball skills, whatever the case is, we never have kids standing around. I mean, that's just we we try to get every second, use every second that we have. And it was interesting that so many of those coaches really had no clue. And any the other thing I want to throw this out there too is, um, you know, if any any other high school coaches or any coaches at any level are listening. You know, I encourage the coaches in Boston, they all need to get their USA basketball license. Very, very, I think it's a very, very important thing to get. And especially with uh, USA basketball's involvement nationwide with youth today, they they really, all coaches really need to get that for, for more, a variety of reasons. So 
Uh, yeah, I, I thought I thought it was uh, it, it was very good. And, you know, it was an eye opener in a lot of regards. How coaches don't even know how to some of these youth coaches don't even know how to run a practice because they're volunteers. You know, you don't know what their background is or you know how much basketball knowledge they have. You know, a lot of them are local YMCA's where you know they don't really have trained coaches maybe or something. You know, or, or rec programs that don't, or don't have any, coaches don't have any training. So they they it, it was very well received and uh, it seemed like they got a lot out of it. I got a lot of questions afterwards. Like I said, I, I could even stay there a lot longer probably. Um, and, and did some stuff with them. But I think it was very beneficial the whole way around. One of the things that I take for granted as a teacher and a coach is just the ability to quickly organize a group of kids into an activity. And when you have people who aren't experienced in that particular area, they struggle. And sometimes that takes a lot of time to just say, okay, this group over here, this group over there, you guys are doing this, you guys are doing that. And I do that, and I'm sure you do it the same way, without even thinking. And a lot of people right. who just don't have that experience don't do that. And then to your point, they end up wasting a lot of time just trying to move kids from one place to another or explain a drill or you know, show them what they're supposed to do. And somebody with a little bit more experience and with a good planned out you know, idea of what they're going to do can get through that a lot faster and therefore maximize the amount of time. Because again, especially on the youth level, a lot of times your practice time, your actual court time is very, very small, very, very limited. You might only have an hour you know, or two once or twice a week and so you got to maximize that time as a youth coach so for you to be able to have an opportunity to impact coaches at that level I think is just tremendous yeah well thanks you know I, I thought it was very beneficial because it was interesting Af afterwards I had a lot of people that took questions and I, I was like blown away in a way blown away but you know I, I understood because there's so many times there are coaches and youth, youth organizations or rec leagues or wide MCAs or YWCAs where you know you volunteer coaches, they don't have any basketball training, uh, they don't know how to run a practice, maybe don't know how to get a, you know a lot of kids involved at once, which which we are very very big on. There's very little downtime, so I basically showed them how to run an effective practice, showed them how to you know showed them some drills to keep kids engaged, uh, more get more kids engaged, and uh, you know I actually went over a lot of basic stuff about how you how you coach the game, how you teach the game, how you organize a practice how you get multiple people involved at once, stuff that maybe they've never ever seen before. And like I said, we had a wide variety. We had we had people from all over New England. We had, you know, coaches from Maine, coaches from, you know, Massachusetts, Connecticut. They came from all over. We had over a hundred coaches. So I think it was uh was very beneficial. Um I think we accomplished what we what we set out to accomplish and I think uh they, they, they seem to really enjoy it. So I was really uh really pleased with the whole with the whole event and my gosh that that facility is just phenomenal you, you got to see that facility just <laughs> i know some of those nba practice facilities are just i mean they're they're unbelievable you, you look at what again you think about the money in the game and one of the things that i'm always struck by whenever i go to an nba game uh you know especially the closer you sit to the floor the more you realize there's just so many you realize what a business it is and there's there's just so many jobs created around the business of basketball i always find that to be fascinating uh you know the number of people that are employed in things that are you know again not maybe directly related to coaching or playing but there's so many of these ancillary things that are put you know that are put out there and i think the you know again the facility just points that out that again these guys are you know it's just it's phenomenal that the best in the world get an opportunity to you know to work and and, and live and, and play in a facility that like the one you're describing and i'm sure like most you know most of the nba cities have at this point yeah well that's become the big thing um you know just like in college now the you know the big recruiting thing is everybody you know wants to have a better practice nicer practice facility than somebody else and that's basically what's happening in the NBA. I, I was recently, uh, you know, I was over to watch the Sixers practice and visit Billy Lang, the assistant coach there, and uh, their facility is top notch. I mean, these facilities have their own chefs. They could basically live there. And I think, I think what they're trying to do is the NBA players trying to keep them there during the off season as much as possible, uh, give them a place that they can feel at home and have, you know, work out anytime they want and all those kinds of things. So yeah, uh, they're just uh, a tremendous amount of money being poured into those things. 
Yeah, no question. I mean, I went back. Uh, I played at Kent State. Went back to an alumni game this uh, this summer and went back in the locker room. Uh, you know, and I compared it to the locker room when I was there. And you know, we were we were in, and you know, they get the whole snack bar set up and the food and the you know the giant TVs and the ping pong table. And they 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 were all excited. They just installed the barber's chair in the locker room, wow. so you could go in there and get your hair cut. And you know, I think back to yeah. basically basically when I was there, it was you know here's your bottles of water. Yeah, it was. I don't even know if it was that. It was it was, it was, you know, you got to turn in your socks at the end of the year because you're going to get them back the next year. You know, you got to turn those things in. And, you know, we had the showers that had the concrete floor. And you'd, you'd walk right. out of the locker room where it was heated. You'd be in this freezing cold shower area after practice. And, you know, you just think about how how much it's evolved. You know, again, everywhere has evolved. You know, NBA has obviously evolved in college the same way. Again, to your point, it's just... You know, in order to be able to continue to attract, whether it's student athletes or attract free agents in the NBA, you know, teams are continuing to do that. Plus, they also know that there's, you know, there's definitely a correlation between, you know, those types of things and performance out on the floor. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, I you talk to you talk to uh, you know I, again with my travels, I used to, you know, have an opportunity to to uh, you know get involved with a lot of different NBA teams and players and different things like that and. Uh, some of the stories I would hear, you know, about I mean, years ago, some of these practice facilities were, some were actually pretty bad. Uh, believe it or not, you know, for for NBA teams, they really were nowhere near, not even close to, to what they have now. And it's just really interesting to see how that, how, how that is all uh, transformed. Yeah, for sure. Well, you, just, you just you just think about the number of coaches that are now on staff or support people, you know, when you think about having, you know, a, nutrition, oh a, a nutritionist and a sports psychologist and, you know, those kind of ancillary, you know, people that, again, 20 years ago, it was, you know, maybe there were two assistants and, you know, the one guy said, hey, you know, don't eat candy bars right before the game or whatever the case is. Don't, don't smoke cigarettes at halftime. <laughs> you know, yeah. and, you know, I mean, yeah, Right, right, exactly. You know, you look at some of those pictures of the old, you know, the old Celtics games, and there's, you know, the smokes hanging above the court from everybody. It's just, it's amazing, the difference in just what people do. I listen to, a, I don't know if you listen at all, but there's a podcast that LeBron and Mike Mancius just did with uh, Tim Ferriss, and they were on there for about an hour and just kind of talking about some of the things that, you know, LeBron does to keep himself, you know, in top condition right. and just from a nutrition and recovery and basically they said you know if he's not playing they're basically during the season they're basically in recovery mode every other waking minute that he has whether it's sleep or nutrition or you know the other things that they're they're doing to keep him at the top of his physical condition and you compare that to you oh know my. you compare that you compare that to like a guy like you know like what was Larry Bird doing in 19 in 1985 to you know, obviously he was doing something, but he wasn't doing the what, things that. You what was know. Charles Barkley doing? Right, I mean, wasn't just, wasn't yeah. golfing. I'll tell you that much. He wasn't <laughs> golfing back then. So it's just a totally. I mean, it's just a totally different world. And and you know, again, obviously, it's it's made the individual players so much better, just in terms of their conditioning and their ability to have all these things around them supporting them to allow them to perform at their best. Okay, so yeah, so I was gonna say. So, you know, so, some other things that have are come up here recently is, um, you know, with our program here at Unleashed Potential, you know, our, our you know, basically when I left 24-Hour uh, Fitness, we all left those positions, you know, we started up our own business and, you know, we, it, it's just grown tremendously here the last couple of years or, you know, or so. And, um, you know, we recently up in Toronto doing a, doing a big clinic for the premier youth organization in the, uh, I shouldn't say we're up in Toronto, we're in Waterloo, which is right outside of Toronto, doing a uh, clinic for over 100 kids, one of the largest uh, premier organizations there in that area because Canada basketball has really grown and has really, really uh, done very well lately uh, internationally and things of that things of that nature. And look at some of the guys that are in the NCAA, they're, they're going to be future NBA players here very soon. But uh, so that, that was a great experience to go up there and do that. Uh, our you know our team of my son and his wife uh, went up there with me and, and we and we did that and what we do also locally is we do a lot of high school programs that are you know in the fall before their season start they have us come in and work with their teams you know for uh, you know eight or ten or twelve sessions so and that's boys and girls so we're really really busy so basically I, I have to balance you know what I do here being so very busy here with you know some of the other things that I'm doing uh, internationally or, or nationally 
Um, also, we'll be going to Canada probably here. I think it's in May. Uh, Canada Basketball has asked me to come speak. They have what they call a super clinic. Has asked me to come speak. Uh, their super clinic where they have coaches from all over the world, FIBA coaches from all over the world come in. So I'm really excited to be to be doing that in May. Really, really uh, humbled to be asked to do that also. Yeah, so where do you see what's the next step for what you're doing with Unleashed? Where do you see that heading in terms of how big, uh, you know, how big do you want it to get? How where do you, where do you see it going in the in the near future? Well, yeah, that that that's a good question. Uh, we're, we're to the point now where um, you know we, we are we are so busy that we are going to have to bring on other people, especially with a lot of stuff. You know, like like we're doing, you know, going to Boston and we've been in Ontario, and you know, we still do stuff here. So you know, and one of the things I learned in my experience at you know twenty four uh, doing this all over the country is that you have to be very very selective on you know who you bring into your program they have to know your terminology they have to know how you teach things uh so it's very very difficult um to bring in bring on new people you know and have that trust level with them to to make sure that that they're doing things the right way um you know and we're giving a good one we pride ourselves on making people better we basically guarantee you that when, when you know when your time's done with us you're not going to be better skill wise you're going to have better, you know better confidence okay and you know we work very closely with high school coaches and things of that nature we don't have any any teams we're, we we train aau we train a huge aau organization in pennsylvania called mid pen motion we do skill work for their whole organization uh we don't get involved with picking teams we don't get involved with coaching teams but what we do is we feel we provide the best skill development that you're going to get in terms of being able to transfer what we do over to the to the games and again it's all based off the usa basketball model uh we follow that very closely as, as i'm you know I'm, in, I'm very involved with usa basketball and i love what they're doing and uh i feel that they're doing it the right way and i, and I basically uh you know believed in the same things they they do now before i even got involved with them so it was a very very uh, good fit for us at unleashed uh, you know to follow that usa basketball model which i think everyone should be following in the youth in the United States. So you talked a little bit earlier about the challenge and one of the things that was so nice about being at 24 Hour Fitness was having the facilities available to be able to expand into. So where you are now, what are your challenges in terms of finding facilities? Is that something that potentially is uh, you know, a hurdle that you're gonna have to get over? Or how do you go about handling where and when you do your training? Yeah, so we we have a facility here in Carlisle that we that we rent or we lease, uh, which we're very fortunate because again, like you said, that's the hardest thing um, to do. So we have that facility, and it's, it's ironically we've just been approached by uh, some people about possibly um, going into another facility, expanding into two facilities. You know, um, one on one side of the river, one on the other side of the river in Harrisburg. So, you know, we're exploring that right now. I, I, I just, the way things are going, I just think that this is going to continue to grow and not only locally, but I, I really like our national, we're starting to develop a national footprint going different places and also, you know, an international footprint um, like, uh, like we did in Ontario. I've also been asked recently to do a clinic in uh, Scotland and in Italy so um, you know uh, things are things are coming up so we're expanding in, in, a, in a big way and it's gonna be yeah we're gonna have some we're gonna have to really uh, you know take some big steps here going forward you know but but again you don't you don't want to expand too quickly that's one thing another thing I learned uh, you know you get you got to be able to handle what you have and do a very very good very very good job we're very we're very careful about that not expanding too quickly because we feel like we have a great thing right now and if you move too quickly sometimes uh, you know, those things can get watered down and, and that's what we do not want to happen. So what's a typical night look like at your facility? Like, so it's a, it's a weeknight during the season here in December and it's a two, it's a Tuesday night or it's a Wednesday night. What does the facility look like in terms of use and in terms of the number of kids that you're, um, that you have coming to work with you on a given, you know, daily, weekly basis? Well, uh, during the school year, basically, you know, it used, used to think, well, it's only it's seasonal. Well, it's not seasonal. We found out very quickly that it's not seasonal anymore, that we basically are pretty much busy all year round, even during the basketball season. 
But our typical a typical night is we usually have a program or two running, whether it's a uh, a shooting program or and usually we combine programs. Like we'll combine a dribbling and shooting program, or we have that that program where there's some competitions. There's you know there's different things. There's some three on three, and then there's some skill work. We'll have a program running like that. Maybe on a Tuesday night, we'll have some individuals, uh, individual training sessions, and we'll have a program. Then we'll have some like a middle school group training program and a high school group right after that. So we're we're in a gym at least probably about four, typically in a four to five hours on a on a, any individual any given night. The only day we really take off is. You know, we try to get one day off a week, maybe uh, Saturday. Sometimes there's exceptions to that because we may be training a team on a Saturday. You know, go traveling. So, you know, we, we say we have home and away events. So sometimes we have to divide and conquer where a couple people will stay home and we'll have some part-time people go with us away, whether we're doing a team or an, a, or an AAU program or something, you know, like the, that mid pen motion group. Um, so we have to divide and conquer sometimes. So it really gets, uh, really gets pretty crazy. Um, in terms of on a daily basis, you really we're only off like one day a week if, if we're if we're lucky. Gotcha. Totally understand. So as you look at growing what you're trying to do, and obviously you've got a lot of things going with your stuff that's going around the country and around the world. But right. if you think about just your core business, what what are you looking for? So as you think about hiring new people, what is it that you're looking for when you're going to sit down with somebody and figure out if they're a good fit for what you guys are trying to accomplish what are you going to look for in those types of people well first of all i, I call i call it sweat equity first of all you know they have to understand that this is not standing standing there and just telling people what to do they have to they have to get involved they have to teach the game you know and, and we talk about different things with uh, skill development you know you have to have contact in a drill so sometimes you may have to body somebody a little bit okay they have to have, you know teach footwork they have to be able to you know actually teach them like we, we believe in a one two step how to teach them to step into their shot you know so we'll actually not only will we you know sit down and interview them but we'll actually have them put them have have them put somebody through a workout or something like that to to show us that they can they can teach the game so yeah it's uh you know it's one of those things where you know it's pretty we have to be pretty sure that they can they can handle they can handle the the job if you want to call it that because uh you know it only takes it only takes one one time to not do a good job with somebody and that can really have a negative effect on your business so we're, we're very big on hiring people who are who can teach the game okay you, you know there's one thing you know people people do a lot of telling but not a lot of people do teaching and, and I really again I, I have found that some of your best teachers are, are are former players who maybe had to work really hard at the game that they didn't have God-given talent so they are they are some of your best teachers in the game and I also found that some of your best coaches are your best teachers. Some of your best teachers are your best coaches. You know, I, I've always believed in that too. So, um, yeah, we're just very big on being able to, because, you know, again, Mike, I, when I travel the country and trust me, I, I could tell you stories all day long. I've watched people train NBA players. You know, you know some people who are NBA trainers and, you know, and, and maybe high level college trainers and then, you know, I've seen people who've trained middle school kids. And a lot of times the kids, the people who trained the middle school kids were better than the people who are training the NBA players. Um, that goes back to my statement. I've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly. That, you know, you really, you know, I, I tell parents this all the time. You really got to check resumes. Okay. You got to really, you got to really, before you hire somebody as a trainer or a skill coach, you really need to check their resume and see what they've done and, you know, do a little bit of background work on them because there's a lot of there's a there's a basketball school trainer in every corner, all right. But uh, you know, you, and that's one thing I learned, you know, through my experience um, for five years going across the country. Um, but you know, there are some very very good ones, and there are some ones that are not very very good. Um, so you got to make sure that um, that you're finding good ones. And, and one more thing I'll throw out with that, you know, Kevin Eastman told me this story. They said what we said one of the best drills he ever got that he used with the Boston Celtics when he was with Doc Rivers was from a middle school coach. You know, and, and, and I and I say this all the time when I speak at different events, whether it's USA basketball or somewhere else, you know, I, I, I say that, you know, some of your high school coaches are your best coaches in the country at any level. I mean you look you look at somebody like Don Showwater. Don Showwater he sh could and should be coaching in the NBA. He's coached a lot of those guys at the junior national level teams. 
Okay, you know, and, and there's there's Don Showater, who was a tremendous high school coach. You know, and there's a lot of coaches like that 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 really, really could coach at any level. You know, just because you coach middle school uh, or high school doesn't mean that you can't, that you're not one of the best coaches in the nation at any level. Um, you know, some of your best coaches are, are some of those people. Yeah, I would agree 100%. I think one of the things that people sometimes forget or sometimes get confused about is that, you know, famous isn't necessarily always the same as the best. Yeah. And then right. I think the other piece of it is, is that there's, there's some people that some coaches that are best suited for working with players at a particular level. Like there's coaches who are tremendous, tremendous trainers that work with high school players. And if I give them a fourth grader, you know, they're going to have no idea what to do. And yet, Correct. you know, and yet you have a trainer who might be outstanding with that fourth grader and yet somebody else might say oh that guy just you know he only works with fourth graders he doesn't really know what he's doing well guess what he does know what he's doing he knows what he's doing at the level where he works and i think that's one of the most yes. important things to keep in mind and with parents and one of the things that sometimes amazes me is you know i'll have you know i i run a lot of camps in the summertime and that's been kind of the bulk of my business and you know, I'll have people that will come that have never been to a camp and they'll drop their kid off and they won't even stick around to watch for five minutes to see if, right. you know, to see what we're going to do. And, and I'm always amazed by that, that, you know, if you're a parent, why wouldn't you want to, to your point, stick around and, you know, check and make sure that what you're getting is going to be a quality product. And, you know, unfortunately, a lot of people don't do that research and don't look. And, and as a result, you know, a lot of these parents that don't know what they're supposed to be looking for or they don't look for anything at all and then they end up and their kid gets a suboptimal experience and that's one of the things that I think that good people out there are trying to make sure doesn't happen that we we try to get as many kids as we can the the best possible coach in front of them as as we can yeah you know and it, here's the thing for me so rewarding you know I, recently I've been training a kid who uh, seventh grader at a local school district around here. Did hasn't played b basketball very long. Uh, it, you know, it was very you know basic, just learning. It was interesting. He got cut from the team last year, one of his teams, and is and we've been training him, or I've been training him for a while now. And one of the most rewarding, this is a seventh grader. One of the most rewarding things for me is the parents recently emailed us and said that he tried out for his team this year, and his his middle school coach told him told them that he's the most improved player that of anybody in in their town, and on that level. To me, that that said volumes. I mean, I, I, I you know that that just made me feel better than anything. I was a high long time high school coach, whatever. Went in my you know won some big games. That to me was more rewarding than anything to have a parent say that that this kid got better, his confidence got better, and the coach told him he was the most improved kid since last year of any kid in her program. So you know th that that's why I do what I do because I, I want to see kids. I want to help kids. I want to help kids get better. To me, that's what's the most important thing. And, and you know, and I say this to a lot of skill trainers that are out there, you know, you better learn how to train kids who maybe aren't the best because most of the kids you train aren't the best. Most, you, there are very few elite kids out there. I mean, that's the small one to 5% out there. 95% of the kids you're going to have to work with aren't the best kids, aren't the best players. Yeah. They're the ones that are trying to become better. Yeah, I agree with you 100%. It's funny because when I got done coaching high school, which was now, I don't know, it's probably going on close to 10 years, and I started at that point, I started doing some, some training, which I had never done before. And as I started, you know, and I was at that time, I was doing some, you know, some research and looking at what other people were doing and what they were charging and, you know, those kinds of things, just trying to put together a, you know, a simple business plan. And at that time, I was under the mistaken impression that, you know, I was going to be getting all these top high level players. And it ended up that because a lot of the camp work that I do is with younger elementary kids, a lot of my business ended up being kids who were, you know, if not beginners, certainly not very advanced players. And so right. I kind of had to tailor what I did to figure out, well, how do I teach those kids at that level that they, you know, I, I have to meet them where they're at and, and help them to learn and help them to grow and help them to get better. And I think to your point that one of the most gratifying things that you can have as a coach is to, is to know that you were able to make a difference in a kid's skill level and a kid's life and help them to get better. And I think that, you know, that's something that you have to be able to adjust what you do 
to the level yes. of the kid that you're going to coach. And again, not not everybody's going to have the opportunity to coach NBA players. Not everybody's going to have the opportunity to train college players. And so you have to figure out where it is that the players that you have, where are they at? Where's their skill level? And then how can I best develop them at the skill level they're at and try to bump them up one skill level from where they are now? Absolutely. You know, I, that's funny, Mike. I call it monitor and adjust. You have to be able to monitor and adjust when you're training, you know, based on the kid, based on the skill level, you know, all, all those different things. You know, that's basically what you do as a teacher. You know, you, as you know, you know, you got to monitor and adjust your, your class, your lesson sometimes. You know, maybe you have this plan, but, you know, you have to make an adjustment based on what's going on in class that day or whatever the case may be. You know, and it's the same for same with coaching, teaching, you know, teaching basketball skill. You have to be able to to adjust and monitor what's going on. Always be monitoring what's going on, but then adjust what you need to adjust. So, Joe, I know you've talked a lot during the podcast tonight about Alan Stein and Coach Kevin Eastman, and they both have books that are either out in the case of Kevin's Why the Best are the Best and soon to be out in the case of Alan's Raise Your Game. So can you talk a little bit about what those two guys have meant to you and a little bit about the books and why people out there should go out and pick up a copy? Yes. Um, you know, I, I, through my long career, I've read a lot of books on, you know, different uh, motivational type books and things of that nature on basketball and just on leadership. And I can say I've already I've already read, received Kevin's book and, and read his book. And uh, what a tremendous piece of, of knowledge, you know, just like he says, you know, why the best are the best. He's literally worked with the best in his long story career. And uh, I just can't say enough good things about about his book and you know if you're a if you're a coach uh, or you have a team of some sort whether it's you know in the business world or the corporate world or in any form of athletics I, I i just can't recommend this book enough and just say this is something that everybody either personally or as a group should be reading and taking a, a lot of great nuggets from that and you know like i said earlier mike uh, Kevin, you know, has, has been very, very good to me. Uh, you know, uh, worked with him for my years back at 24, and I continue, you know, to to gain knowledge off of him. You know, we stay very close, and you know, we connect a lot. And uh, like I mentioned earlier, you know, he was one of the people that was very instrumental in getting me, um, you know, uh, working with USA Basketball. Uh, I know he recommended me to Coach Showwater also. Um, so I just can't say enough about his book and, 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 and what he can, what he brings to the table for anyone personally or in a business or a team setting. And also Alan Stein, Alan Stein, you know, as I stated earlier, is, is one of the best in the world at what he, what he does. Uh, I know he's, he's now doing a lot of corporate speaking as is coach Eastman and, uh, you know, I, his book, uh, is tremendous also. And, you know, it, it just deals with all aspects of, of life. Again, not just the athletic aspects, but you know the uh, the, the personal aspects of being a, what a, what a good leader is all about, and how to make yourself a good leader. You know, through communication, and relationships, and whether you're dealing again with teams or corporate or business settings. So um, I can't say enough about those two books. Those two books are, are are probably two of the best that have come out that I have seen in a long, long time. And I'm I'm very happy to to put out there and say, you, you trust me, you would not be disappointed. To, to get those books. And I know they, they currently are, you know, um, and, and Kevin's book's already out, and I know in Alan's case, pre-sailing, that they're already getting a lot of teams and organizations that are, are buying those books as a, as a group and literally dissecting those books page by page, chapter by chapter in their team meetings or organizational meetings. Um, so again, um, two tremendous people, two, two tremendous books. I couldn't agree more. I actually went out just in the last day or two and ordered three copies of the book, um, Kevin's book for my kids for Christmas. And I have, I have a ninth grader, a seventh grader and a third grader. And I'm not sure that my third grader is going to be reading it this year, but at some point I just think it's such a valuable book, not just for all the groups that you mentioned, but I was so impacted by it that I just feel like it's going to be a great read for my kids. And the same thing for Alan's book. Uh, it's just, not just for basketball coaches, not just for business leaders, but I think if you have a child in your house who's old enough to read and understand some of the concepts of leadership and culture and teamwork, I think those both books are just tremendously valuable resources that 
anybody would benefit from picking up and taking some time to, as you said, to dissect it page by page and really get as much out of it as you possibly can. Yeah, you know, and it's one of those things where, you know, you, you sit down with that book and you know, I was so excited when I when I first, you know, got them um, to be able to just sit there and, and, and just start to go through it. And, and it does take some time because there's so much, it's just loaded with so many different nuggets and different things um, that, you know, you get your highlighter out and you just go crazy with that, you know, trying to just, you know, take in all, all, all the good stuff that's in those those books. I couldn't agree with you more, Joe. All right, so let's jump back to the beginning of our story here. Talk about sort of your, let's let's give a, a summary of your life story and go back to when you were teaching and then kind of talk about how your life took this turn that you've ended up in a place that I'm sure you never really thought and you had to, you had to adjust and obviously it ended up being a very good adjustment for you. But can you just talk about sort of the relationships and the things and just kind of summarize what we've talked about tonight and put it into a little, uh, you know, nice neat package of kind of how your life evolved from when you were just, um, you know, when you were teaching and coaching in Carlisle. Yeah. I I think what's, what really sums it up, uh, Mike and Jason is, you know, you know, and I've said this before. You know, you always have to do your best at what you're doing at the time. You know, when I when I taught at Carlisle High School, I made sure my lesson plans were done correctly. I made I made sure that I stuck to them. With you know, I had to monitor and adjust lesson plans. Coaching, you know, you have, you have to you have to go through some failure. You know, my first couple of years, you know, at, at Carlisle were tough because we had just gotten over to state championship years. The talent wasn't there. You know, you th- success is hard. You have to, you know, if it was easy, everybody could do it. But you have to work hard at what you're doing. You have to monitor and adjust. You have to, you, you never know when somebody is watching what you're doing. Relationships are huge, okay? I mean, I, I formed great relationships down at Duke. We call it the brotherhood, just like they call their, you know, we're, we're, we're the camp, we're the, we're the brotherhood because, you know, many of us have worked together for 20-some years. I mean, I've worked with people that I could, I could go on all day. I mean, of people who are now at the professional level, at the college, big time college level, people that have passed through there, and, you know, and you make relationships and you treat people the right way and you do things the right way. You know, and going back to what Coach K said about putting the right people on your bus, you know, I, I'm very fortunate because I try to surround myself with the best, you know, by, by forming relationships and, and doing a good job. That's, you know, that's why I, you know, when I tell people, you know, having mentors as, as Kevin Eastman, we, we text just about every other day. You know, or are in contact one way or another. Uh, you know, Coach K. You know, again, you know, sharing an email with him recently about, you know, one of his former players, one of his former teammates or classmates at the at, at, at the at, at West Point. Okay, so I mean, you know, Coach Showalter, my relationship with him now at USA Basketball. I mean, these people are all they have all the same qualities or standards. So you got to find people who have the same standards as you. You know have great standards and, and, and people who are good people and form those relationships and, 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 and work hard and just, you know, I can't can't say that message enough. You never know who's watching what you do. You know, this, this whole body language thing, when I talk to kids, you know, you, you can't show negative body language. you got to have good body language. I mean, everybody's everybody's watching you or, you know, what you put on social media. But 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 again, my my whole story goes back to, you know, working hard, Trying to trying to better myself, not worrying about the next job, but trying to make myself better in other ways. You know, like going back to getting my personal training certification, just to try and incorporate that into my basketball skill work. You know, those kind of things. Here, I, I was doing CrossFit. I was doing a CrossFit certification. I was one of the oldest people there in my fifties. I could barely even drive home. I was so tired at the end. But I, I felt. <laughs> <just like I'm, laughs> I mean, literally, I, I laid awesome. in my car. For two hours. Yeah, I laid in my car for two hours. But I'm telling you, I we incorporate. We use a heavy med ball now with our speed, agility, quickness, and strength training. We use a heavy med ball. We use different med balls and stuff for for different uh, different things to to increase strength, you know, and, and core and stuff like that, and for basketball movements, you know, getting back to what we do with the performance stuff. So, I mean, you have to always, here, here's what I heard this the other day, and I, this is perfect. You have to have an urgency in life, okay? You have to have an urgency in life to better yourself. Have a, have a growth mindset, all right? Make yourself uncomfortable trying to make yourself better, just like we try to get our players to do. Be getting, you know, become uh, comfortable being uncomfortable. You know, as a coach, you have to do those same things. And I, I think that's what I've done, you know? And I, and I think, 
you know, again, it was a process. It's not something that happened overnight. Today, I think one of the things that, that I like to say to young coaches is, is there are no overnight successes. There's there's no shortcuts. You know, you, you go and do your job and work hard and, and do the best where you're at. And I think that's I think that's what my story is about. You know, I, uh, you know, I wasn't trying to to climb ladders and all those kinds of things, but um, I just worked hard at what was what I was doing. Yeah, I think by going ahead and making sure that you continue to learn throughout your lifetime, to me, that's one of the things that I think if I look back on myself when I was 22, 23, 24, uh, I think I didn't do a very good job of that at that time. I think mm-hmm. at that time I thought that I knew a lot more than what I did. And now, as I'm much, much older, <laughs> I feel like I know very, very little and as a result, I try to get my hands on as much stuff as I can to to learn and have an opportunity to talk to as many people and pick the brains of people who have had success in areas where I want to have success. And again, to go back to our friend Kevin Eastman, uh, you know, you want to you want to be that lifelong learner. You want to be able to to do the things that, in order to be able to do them, you have to. You have to learn. You have to continually push yourself. You have to continually try to grow and, and get better and expand your horizons. And that's one of the things that I feel like I've gotten tremendously better at from the time I was a young person. Uh, I don't think I did a very good job of that. And I think that for you, that's obviously been the story of how you've ended up where you've been. You put in the time. You've continued to learn. You've worked very, very hard. And then you've had the opportunity to have tremendous relationships that were built off those things that you did that you did it without the idea of hey i'm gonna go and do this and i'm gonna impress coach k and now all of a sudden i'm gonna have this relationship and then that's gonna allow me to do this and that it it wasn't about that it was about being in a spot and working hard and doing what you're supposed to do and then someone takes notice of it and you have these relationships and again once you have the relationship then you continue to work hard and what I've found, and especially, again, I can tell you in all honesty with this podcast, it's been incredible that just having the platform of the podcast has enabled us to develop relationships with people that, you know, without the podcast, we probably never would have had an opportunity to have the relationship with simply because we wouldn't have we wouldn't have reached out going back to your story of writing the letter to Coach K. We wouldn't have reached out to, you know, to Kevin Eastman. We wouldn't have reached out to Coach Showalter, uh, but having the platform has enabled us to do that, and now it's enabled us to build relationships and continue to work hard at what we're doing. And hopefully, you know, by having people on like yourself and other great guests that we've had on to be able to share their knowledge of the game, we're able to get some information out to people in our audience that can help them to be better. And that to us is really what it's all about: the ability to be able to impact and grow the game of basketball, which we love. Um, you know that that to me is what it's all about no you know what you know what and, and um i was so you know when you called me um i i had listened to a couple of your podcasts i wasn't quite i wasn't sure at first who it was but I, you guys have done a tremendous tremendous job with what you're doing i, I just think it's uh fantastic uh what, what you guys are doing like you said you're you're connecting with a lot of different people you're getting a lot of great information out there and, uh, you know, I can't tell you how thankful I am that you guys asked me to be on here. Um, you know, anything I could ever do to help, um, I'm more than willing to do that. That's one part of that's one part of me, Mike and Jason, that I, that I also talk about all the time. Uh, the game's been very good to me. Um, I really enjoy helping young coaches. That's, that's, that's why I continue to do the things I do, because I want to share as much knowledge with as many coaches as I can, you know, as long as I'm able to. So, because I, I feel like I've been very fortunate um, you know, through a lot of hard work and relationships, great relationships, but I've been very fortunate to to be able to do a lot of things that, that I'm able to do now. So that's my way of giving back to the game. So I, I jumped at this opportunity when you guys asked. I was I, I was thrilled, and that's right on the top top of the things that I've been able to do is to, to be on your guys uh, on the Hoop Heads podcast. Well, I can't thank you guys enough, Joe. We really appreciate it. Uh, I, I can't thank you enough for being willing to take time out of your schedule to be able to jump on with us 
I really feel like you've given people uh, a tremendous amount of information. I feel like from our conversation we had before the podcast and then from the hour and a half or whatever we're on about right now, I still feel like there's, I still feel like we probably have three or four more hours in us that we could keep going and, and, and tell and tell more stories. But to go along with what you just said uh, about being willing to share with young coaches, can you go ahead and share how people can get in contact with you, whether it's your Twitter, your email, just let people know who have listened to the show and want to reach out to you. Maybe they have a question. Uh, maybe they're in your area and they want to, you know, get to work with Unleashed and uh, just reach out to you, share your contact information, and if there's anything else that we didn't hit on that you want to share before we get out of here, go ahead and uh, go ahead and do that as well. Yeah, well, one more thing I'll give you because you mentioned about Coach Eason, and uh, you know it's just interesting because, like I said, he has shared a tremendous amount of stuff with me and continues to do that, and we've been together so you know many many times now, and it's just interesting. Just I wanted to hit on this because you you, you uh, reminded me of something. You know, talk about someone that's a lifelong learner. Look, you know, what tremendous career he's had. You know, every time I'm with him, you know, he has a notebook or something with him. And this is something that I that I I've always liked to take notes and stuff like that. But uh, it really floored me how you know we're having breakfast one morning and and there he is. You know, we're just in conversation. He has his notebook out, so you know, if there's something that I say that he likes, you know, he's he's writing in his book and now. You know, we're texting back and forth things. I send him texts of different things that I heard that he might like and stuff like that. So here's someone at the top of his profession, you know, and he's, yeah, you know, I'm certainly not a Kevin Eastman. You know, I can only hope to be a Kevin Eastman someday, but he's, you know, maybe taking something down that I said or that I sent him. So, I mean, that that's that's just incredible to me that, um, you know, that, that he is that way. Yeah, wow. absolutely. His, I mean, I, I mean, I we got a chance. I had an opportunity to talk to him for about a half hour on the podcast, and he was tremendous on there. And obviously, uh, his book. Uh, there, there's just you know, there's so many things in his book that I've already pulled out that have made me a better person. I've got, I've got one copy going, getting ready to go to each one of my kids for Christmas because I just think it's something that there's so much wisdom in there that can be shared, that are that's applicable to basketball, but even more importantly, you're just applicable to life. So I'm with you 100. percent If you can help give anybody the gift of being a lifelong learner, you're going to help them to go a long way in whatever it is that they choose to do. Yep, for sure. So let me give you our Unleashed Twitter. It's um at unleashed 717 and then um my personal twitter is at coach s 717 and then uh, my email is j staz j s t a s and one a n d one that's the number one at centurylink.net c e n t u r y l i n k dot net so I can reach at any of those. Awesome. Joe, again, we can't thank you enough for hopping on with us. We truly appreciate it. I know everybody out there uh, enjoyed the episode. And to our entire audience, we thank you for listening. And we will catch you on our next episode. Thanks. Hello, Hoop Heads. This is Alan Stein, Jr. My new book, Raise Your Game, High Performance Secrets from the Best of the Best will be available from all major book retailers on January 8th. Raise Your Game takes a rare peek behind the curtain and shows you what the top coaches and players in the game do during the unseen hours. I share their routines, rituals, and habits, as well as proven strategies that you can implement with your team immediately. If you want to maximize your coaching impact and influence, Order your copy today at RaiseYourGameBook.com. And in the spirit of the holidays, if you're interested in purchasing multiple copies for your coaching staff, team, or program, I am offering several bonuses, like a 40% discount, signed copies, and a private video call with your team. But you'll have to place your order before Christmas. Once again, go to RaiseYourGameBook.com for everything you need. If you're looking for a great way to spend the holidays playing some basketball, please join us at one of our Head Start Basketball Holiday Camps on December 27th and 28th, 2018. We'll have a camp at Hoop Guru Courthouse in Hinckley and also at St. Pascal Baylon School in Highland Heights. The Head Start Basketball Holiday Camps will emphasize the fundamentals of basketball with individual attention given to each camper. You'll improve your basketball skills 
and have a ton of fun at the Head Start Basketball Holiday Camp. To register or get more information, please visit our website, www.headstartbasketball.com. Head Start Basketball's Player Development Academy offers Cleveland area players a unique opportunity to improve their basketball skills. Regardless of a player's age, skill level, or position, training with Head Start Basketball will elevate your game to the next level. Do you want to improve your ball handling, become a better shooter, or develop into a more skilled, confident player? Our academy classes offer training that's designed to do just that. Our training sessions are innovative and will have you learning skills that are transferable to actual games. We have four different class skill levels for boys and girls ages 4 and up. All Player Development Academy classes will be held at the Strongsville Recreation Center. For more information or to get registered, please visit www.headstartbasketball.com. Thanks for listening to the Hoop Heads podcast brought to you by Head Start Basketball.